Hey everybody, welcome to the Super Feast podcast. It's Mason here and I've got an epic conversation coming for you today with some of my favorite, um, favorite men in the health space. So I've got two names and faces you're going to recognize. So we've got Sage Damas from, you're joining us from over in LA, addictive wellness, incredible tonic herb infused sugar-free chocolates, as well as um, sm like smoothie elixir packs and all infused with uh, all these beautiful tonic herbs and mushies we're gonna be going into and as well as tonic herbs on their own. And um, Sage is one of my absolute favorite voices coming out of that like gnarly melting pot of LA with this like, you know, just absolutely next leveling health and this integration of health systems from all around the world. And Sage has been in it for so many years. You've heard him talk on it before and you've heard his wealth of knowledge. It's always surprising what he's gonna be able to come up with. And today talking about Candida is gonna be no different. And I've also got Dan Sipple, friend, functional naturopath down on the south coast of Sydney. Um, and Dan is like absolutely my favorite go-to naturopath. We've been friends for a long time. He is now officially my mother's naturopath and mine and Tani's naturopath. And so that was that's a beautiful um, little evolution that's gone about. Um, boys, today we are going on a deep dive three-way conversation around the infection, the yeast-like infection, Candida albicans. Welcome, guys. Thank hey, you for having us, Mason. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's going to be so good, so fun. All right, you know, I don't know how many other people are going to be having the best time, absolute ever, having a conversation around a gnarly infection that's become, I guess it's not as trendy, I'd say, as it used to be, but it's definitely still a hot topic, um, especially a hot topic in the West. So Candida albicans, um, yeast-like fungal um, fungus within the body that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, now it's absolutely a normal part. These Candida cells are a normal part of our body, of our flora, um, exist within our, uh, our mucous membranes, our skin, mouths, genitalia, vaginas, intestines, and other organs. We're going to be talking about this phenomena today where we see some kind of environmental or lifestyle, or maybe it's been a modern medicine antibiotic intervention that's then led to an upset within our, um, our microbiome and basically in many other areas, including immune deficiencies, that's led to this fungus yeast within the body then overgrowing and getting what many people have experienced with with which is uh fungal overgrowth so first of all i just want to um so sage was going to go to you to say hey and do you want to like let people um give people a bit of an insight of your history with candida yeah absolutely thank you mason so for me i dealt with candida firsthand when i was i was growing up i was a vegetarian but not a healthy one by any means i was just on carb overload throughout my whole childhood of like rice and pasta and pizza and any any carb i could get my hands on um was very fortunate not to be eating fast food but still was not the most ultimate diet ever and so when i came into my teen years about 15 and a half i started developing chronic acne um probably more to do with my my diet than anything else um you know diet and combination of hormones and things like that but it I didn't know what to do with it at the time. You know, I, I tried lots of different topical things and, and things of that nature, but nothing was really making an impact and helping me. And it's such a stressful thing as a kid to be going through. Mm -hmm. And I resorted to taking antibiotics because it was the only thing that uh, was going to really do me any good at the time in terms of the superficial results that I was looking for. I didn't understand the full repercussions and the future downsides of it. I just knew this is going to help me in the short term, not to be so self-conscious. So and, and I had no other solutions. I didn't know of all these other things that I know about now. I wish I would have. So I was on twice daily antibiotics from age 16 until 19 and a half. So Nally. these years of antibiotics, if you can imagine, wreaked havoc on my microbiome and le left me right for Candida to come in and take over. So it was a, a, a thing where in the beginning, I, I enjoyed fruit so much and you, you know, even as I was getting healthy and, and getting onto uh, much more of a natural diet, I still really enjoyed fruit. And so I didn't want to give that up. And, and that was the one thing holding me back from really making progress against Candida. And I kind of was in that weird balance for a while um, where I, I couldn't make the jump to go fully into what was necessary to push back on the Candida. Um, and eventually it got to the point where I got, I got real mentally strong about it and got strict. And um, went through uh, like the body ecology diet stage one and where it's really strong, cutting out carbs, cutting out sugars, um, bringing in probiotics and fermented foods and some of the most powerful antifungal and immune enhancing herbs. 
And over the course of a couple of years, that got me, uh, really got me through it and got me to a much better stage of health. Um, and life has been much better ever since. Yeah, I mean, to the extent where I think that history of yours has just played such a huge part in your life that it's like absolutely entwined in your philosophy of the ways that you make your chocolates and your elixir blends, right? You mean, right. Like, that's, that's why I have sugar-free chocolate is because I wanted to be able to still have a sweet treat while I was in the candida recovery stages and it didn't really exist. It wasn't out there. All you know, There's all these chocolates made with agave and coconut palm sugar and all that. And regardless of where somebody may stand on those things, they are still going to be feeding bacteria, fungus, yeast, and molds in the body. And um, it's not going to be your friend most times, and especially not on a, a recovery from candida where you need to not be feeding these guys. So I made it out of necessity, and it's turned into a, a beautiful life of, of being a chocolate maker. Yeah, I love it. Getting the, you know, the fruits of the healing journey. And I still attest that it's like the only sugar-free chocolate that I actually really can thoroughly enjoy. Um, Thank you. Dan, you've had quite a history with candida now you've you know really you've had this first clinical um, first-hand clinical experience for a um, number of years now i'm interested to hear what your path with candida has been yeah sure and um, not too dissimilar to to sage it very much came um as a result of antibiotic exposure and so um i've i've, I've talked a couple of times on previous podcasts how in my early years sort of uh, 17 18 19 um i had um, issues with viral load and autoimmunity, which kind of set the scene for, um, you know, other opportunistic organisms to really to take over. And um, it was a course of about five or six years where I was kind of floating in that space where my immune system was that compromised to the point to where um, I would actually need antibiotics by the time these, inf these bacterial infections would, would take over. Um, and it was like a vicious cycle that got set up. And I see that often um, in, in clinical practice too, where once that cycle starts, it's very hard to get off that train, particularly if you are, um, you know, being, um, you know, dictated to by the, the Western medical model, which at the time I, I was heavily, you know, under the um, influence by. So mm, had its claws in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's right. And so lots and lots of antibiotics, I'd get better. Um, you know, I'd push my body a bit, the infections would return to the point to where there was clear and overt infection, um, not knowing anything about, you know, herbal protocols or, you know, functional medicine or naturopathy or anything of that kind of world um, at this stage. But it was very much a, a long road to kind of undo that vicious cycle and get out of that loop. Um, and incorporating things like say just talking about with diet and lifestyle and cutting the alcohol and the sugars out um, you know optimizing vitamin d status restoring the, the microbiome and things like that so it was definitely one of those things which didn't go away overnight and i think that's uh, really important to drill into the listeners too as well as that um, once you get traction with something like candida you really need to set up a, a, a lifestyle that facilitates long-term resistance against that so that you know, these opportunistic organisms can't take back over. Candida is such an interesting one. Um, the level of symptoms that arise from a chronic infection are so vast. And it's one of those ones when you read the list, you go, my gosh, I don't know if that list is very useful because there's so many diff other um, infections or uh, deficiencies that can give rise to it. But then there are, of course, some specifics. And so, I mean, like when like looking at the list, you've got chronic fatigue, brain fog, digestive issues. And then when you start getting down a little bit more specifically to reoccurring yeast infections, oral thrush, uh, even going into sinus infection, you can even start seeing candida has been implicated when there's food allergies, when there's intolerance. Of course, a dead giveaway is fungal infections on the skin, um, within the nails, you know, especially within the feet. Mm -hmm. And then a weak immune system, quite often is it a chicken or an egg? You know, you can see that when there is weak immunity, especially when you see medications in particular, like antibiotics and chemotherapy, um, and then hormone disruptors like uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, what is it? Um, corticosteroids, Dan? Is that, yeah. am I saying that right? That's right, yeah. Immunosuppressants, um, corticosteroid-based medications, absolutely, because they're, they're basically squashing the immune response, which although ameliorates symptoms, allows these guys to take an even stronger hold. Mm. Well, and then you even see like joint pain and definitely the alteration of moods coming about from candida. And so we go, okay, you know, unless, the, <laughs> unless you've got some of the telltales, um, you know, like reoccurring thrush and 
um, fungal, fungal thrush from the mouth and fungal infection coming up on the skin. How do you clinically hone in on a diagnosis that in fact we do have um, candida cells proliferating and excessive in the body? Is that question directed at me, Mason, just to clarify? Oh, it, is, it is, and I will just make, and I, I don't think you have clinic, Sage, and maybe you didn't know that. Day. No, no clinic for me. So I, I took that, the clinically word in there to, to signal them. <laughs> um, yeah, so to answer that question, that, that's a really good question, Mace, to, to really sort of hit on the head, um, you know, in the forefront, because I think with a, a, an issue like candida, it's very, very rare that I will see that um, alone. I, what I usually find is that's, that's there in concert with just an, a good old dysbiosis where you'll see bacterial pathogens that are overgrown. You may or may not see parasites as well. So, um, to be quite honest, I don't think I've ever seen just one clean cut, pure case of candida without, without all that going on with, with, with some sort of viral load or bacterial imbalance. And so what we find is, is that the, the best kind of treatment um, is, is not just to isolate the, the, the yeast in this case and attack the yeast. It's to nurture that whole ecosystem, to treat it like a, you know, an ecosystem um, where you're setting up a new environment, basically, where it's not conducive to it to thrive, uh, which, as we say, does incorporate diet, lifestyle, herbs, um, and, and the whole concert and symphony of things. But um, in terms of testing, um, you can do blood testing for antibodies to see if the immune system has actually, you know, seen the candida albicans and, and made uh, antibodies against it from the B cells. The only downside to a test like that is you don't know whether the immune system has made those antibodies 10 years ago or if it's, or if it's happening right now. Um, and that's where the symptoms really need to guide you. If there's overt signs of candidiasis, like on the tongue, the toenail, um, the respiratory issues and whatnot, then you've got more of a case for that. So that's where usually doing the stool test um, and looking at candida markers in uh, combination with that blood is really um, a really good way to back that up. Because if you're seeing it on both, you're seeing it in the stool and um, antibodies, then you've got quite a good case for it. Uh, for being currently present. And in that case, that's when, you know, obviously you want to uh, make the protocol more specific to, to yeast in that case. Sage, how do you, how do you go about this? Because um, I completely, like, I like the fact that I've got ac like access to Dan's knowledge and can get a little bit more specific. And I know you recommend this a lot in getting some, um, you know, getting some testing and getting some panels done so that you're not just like shooting in the dark, but how do you from like, dare I say, kind of like, I know I can definitely say I come from a more folky perspective when it comes to um, gentle diagnosis. But from your perspective, how do you go about that and really identifying that candida is in fact present? Yeah, and I don't know. I don't know exactly what your healthcare system is like in Australia, but I know here in the U.S., um, it's expensive to do lots of testing, um, and very often things will not be covered by insurance, and you'll have mm. to pay for them out of pocket. And so, I always find it's really nice to be able to at least somewhat get a little bit of progress in terms of a self-diagnosis before you go and in investing in testing. So at least you know what tests to go do, so you don't mm. have to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because it can get real expensive. So. With candida, as you mentioned, it's you're looking at a lot of symptoms in terms of recurring infections, oral thrush, uh, fungal issues. Um, and then it's, it's a combination of looking at your symptoms and then looking at your history in terms of antibiotic use. If you've had extended use of antibiotics, um, especially if it's like for two weeks or more in the past, your odds are going to be pretty high that at some point candida has taken a good foothold uh, in your system and, and started to really proliferate beyond the natural levels that you would find. Like candida at small levels is actually a, a good part of a healthy microbiome, good for nutrient absorption and beneficial in that way. But it's when things are thrown out of balance, you're gonna get into a lot of trouble. So there's many really good uh, like questionnaires out there online that people can do just to get an initial idea, um, just to get a rough feel. And then from there, you can progress with the testing, which I think is incredibly important. And if you can afford it, uh, whether it's this kind of testing or whether you're looking at your thyroid or hormones, rather than just experimenting without data indefinitely, and you know maybe five years from now, you actually figure out what's really going on, save yourself a ton of time and a lot of trouble and probably save yourself money in the long run in terms of being able to spend money on the right supplements and herbs to, mm -hmm. to help you out and foods rather than um, you know dealing with this diagnosis. For an extended period of time. 
Well, let's say, let's get into the food here. Um, often we know that, yeah, we, we've, we've had a look at the kind of the pharmaceutical angle, the antibiotics, especially, um, you know, like especially going in and nailing the microbiome and, and causing our ability to actually um, create the environment where we can naturally regulate healthy levels of this yeast and candida cells being within the body. Let's have a look at the foods that you see being an accumulative force or an aggravator that lead our organ function, immune function, and microbiome function to being getting to the point where candida can actually take hold. What are the, you know, what are the, what are these, what are these nasty ones or excessive ones that get nasty when they're excessive? Yeah, I think um, it, it, it is many things that happen in conjunction. Like probably if you had never taken antibiotics and you had a really strong immune system, you could deal with having some of the wrong foods coming into the body, right? Like even if you're, you never did antibiotics and you're having tons of sugar, but your immune system is really strong ancestrally, maybe you're okay, maybe you can pull it off. Or um, if you know, you're having lots of sugar and then in combination you're having, say, uh, ground mushrooms, like culinary mushrooms that haven't been properly cleaned and, are, and tend to be um, very contaminated in that state. These are different from tree mushrooms. I wanna be real clear about the distinction. Yeah, I'm going to leave a lot of time for us to really get into that distinction. Thanks yeah, for bringing yeah. that so up we'll so we'll early. A little bit later. Patience, mm. everybody. We'll get there. <laughs> Patience, and, you mushroom fiends. <laughs> and then de depending on the individual, right, because everybody's got a bit of a different setup in terms of the microbiome and digestive powers. But for a lot of people, I think also poor food combining, uh, especially having lots of uh, like uh, leafy greens that take time to digest and are very fibrous and combining that with like really sugary, starchy fruit. Um, I found that for a lot of people, the, the fruit wants to burn up fast and move through and it's like rocket fuel. Um, but then you have, you know, it's like a Ferrari on a freeway, wants to go, doesn't like being driven slowly. And then you have these green leafy vegetables that take time to digest. They're very nutritious. They're like a big rig carrying lots of, you know, nutrition on them and fiber and whatnot. And they slow down the traffic and the Ferrari is getting into road rage. And it's mm. like, it goes, you know, develops into a situation where there, it's a ripe breeding ground for a proliferation of, of bad bacteria as things start to ferment in there. So that could also be um, a, a situation that, well, it may not specifically cause it wouldn't be like a root source of candida it would not be supportive or helpful if it was something that you were dealing with mm, love it hey dan what, what about you in terms of dietary lifestyle factors that are really going to come in and you know if and i like what you said there um sorry sage like there there's going to be different constitutions at work here they're going to have a ancestral con like you you might have been might be the difference between being breastfed and not being breastfed in terms of whether your immune system is strong or just ancestrally whether you've got that that strong gene expression within the immune system and then acknowledging that because long term i think you've definitely seen it over in, in la i definitely have here in the health scene where you almost get to a paranoia of candida becoming crippling to your lifestyles. Do, is that something you see happening a lot at this age? Well, a little bit, you know, it, it's not people are, the awareness of it in the community is not as strong. I would say as it was in like 2011, 2012, there was the glory days back then, you know, you know, these, these, these trends and focuses always like kind of come and go. Cause I don't know, there's kind of a, it's weird because it's still just as much an issue as ever but people kind of feel the need to talk about something new so they can sell new books and post new videos. So sometimes we move more further beyond some of the basics than we really need to. Uh, there, you know, the, the solution is often right at hand. Yeah, very funny. And, and I agree. I think, I think Candida is having a PR nightmare right now. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I Evo think we, has gotten uh, is, is stolen all the attention from it. Yeah, it, it has. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Dan, what what's your what's your take on this dietarily, lifestyle wise? What are the conditions that you see as precursors to, especially if someone has the constitution that is right for the picking mm. for candida being an issue? What do you see those being? Yeah, and look, I I completely agree with Sage, and I think I'd add on to that. Um, what I find really prevalent is when people's circadian rhythms are out, when they're using, you know, dietary sources to jack up, you know, their adrenal response. So caffeine, you know, refined sugar, obviously, mm -hmm. um, nailing the circadian rhythms and leaving space between meals sounds really, really simple, but it is quite pivotal when you're dealing with, um, any sort of, you know, dysbiotic environment when it comes to, to the gut or the respiratory system or any immune sort of suppression, 
getting um, getting the circadian rhythms locked in and normalizing the nervous system and the adrenal response is huge because you think about it, if you've got fire going on in that, that dry digestive system or anywhere in the body um, that is you know, of a yeast origin or viral origin or whatever, your adrenals are constantly seeing that and trying to put out those flames with, with a fire extinguisher. You know, hence the hence the adrenal fatigue uh, phenomena. So, not normalizing those rhythms and supporting the adrenals can't be understated. Yeah, I would definitely attest to that. I mean, we've spoken about. Um, I think I've spoken to both of you previously on the podcast. You know, just like talking about digestion, and in case people aren't realizing, digestion has a huge part to play with Candida albicans, um, especially from a um, from a Taoist perspective. When you start seeing weak spleen chi. Um, that can really be the feeding ground from a triple burner perspective, that middle burner, you know, really emerging with like, whether it's just dampness or weakness within the spleen and therefore that whole spleen and digestive network through the stomach, then allowing strong digestive function, strong um, uh, governance of your bacterial levels. What, you, what we see there is that can be the catalyst to then going down into the lower burner where we see damp heat emerge and we start seeing yeast infections within, the, um, within basically through, through, throughout the entire um, uh, sexu sexual organ system. And then also then moving from that, that middle burner to the upper burner where we see heat and fire through the lungs with, um, with allergies and all those respiratory issues that emerge and through the heart as well. So basically, I'm going to like pause it there because I think if I open up that can of worms and making distinct uh, in, the, in these treatment protocols, I'm going to take us in a completely other direction. But there's a few things, Dan, that you were touching on that I just really want to, I want, I want to leapfrog off. And that is definitely the jing and exhaustion aspect here. Mm. We've talked about the fact that um, I like seeing the, the Jing as the pilot light for digestion. If you are exhausted, if you're adrenally exhausted, if you're leaking that essence, if you're relying on coffee, if you're mentally stressed and you're in emotional patterns that you know continue to make you, you know, those things that make you emotionally excessive, you're going to very much see that you don't have the foundations and roots within your body, within the core energy centers of the kidneys to really stabilize you. And that you're going to see a thorough um, uh, endocrine disruption go on at that stage because you are overly adrenalized and um, you can't produce natural cortisol. You can't therefore get down to like, you have to rely on these cortical, um, cortisone creams and all that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, you're not going to be able to lead to that real healthy sex organ function. And so basically that core is like, you see that consistently, I'm sure you do as well, Sage, where that exhaustive, Jing depleting lifestyle doesn't allow for the pilot light to go on so that the spleen can actually turn on that fire and appropriately it can really, it can really yeah. become a vicious cycle. I think it can really become a vicious cycle because with the candida, you, it's it creating higher levels of, of uh, permeability of the digestive lining. So you're getting essentially leaky gut, and this is releasing not only the, the bits of food and undigested materials into the bloodstream, which is causing inflammation and autoimmunity but it's also uh, releasing the toxins that are being produced by the candida, its own, basically the, the candida poo uh, being released throughout your body. So now you've got systemic inflammation firing away mm. and that is gonna be a major leak of Jing. So mm. that, that itself is depleting the adrenals and it's this vicious cycle because then, okay, now your adrenals are depleted. Now you can't fuel your, your immune system right? Because you're just, you're experiencing exhaustion and the candida can even grow further. And it, it, it's uh, really unfortunate, but at the same time, if you can get in there with a little bit of action and start, you know, making some moves on it, you can slow down that cycle and start to spin it back. Well, let's start here in terms of looking at treatment. Once we've identified that perhaps we have an environment and as Dan was saying, you know, you're not going to be able to just isolate candida. There's most likely going to be a number of co-infections and definitely going to see a bunch of, um, I'm sure like you're going to see a bunch of worms of, of various types being, being present at that time because we're going to see a suppressed immune function. But starting off the bat, quite often we're looking at removing the excessive candida from the body, cleaning up the diet, and basically, I guess, loosely saying this is going to be a, a cleansing or cleaning aspect of the protocol. Now, at this point, um, I'd like to get both your two cents, but start with Sage. Do you like to bring in, of course, lifestyle factors, I think is obvious that are going to reduce stress, but do you like to bring in 
herbs or other practices to, for lack of a better word, tone our, um, our ability to store and restore gene? Yeah, of course. So um, naturally, we, we, you and I, and, and I bet Dan is into these as well, you want to look at your top jing building herbs, things like Hoshu Wu, Cordyceps, Sistanche, Romania, Morinda. And so I think building that base of core vitality is an essential component of any healing program, basically, mm. because without that, your body just does not have the energy and the safety. Uh, I think when you're, when you're in such a jing vulnerable state, and you're, you're you know, prepared to run out of fuel and die at just about any moment, your body is afraid and not gonna divert resources to you know, dealing with your fungal issues because it's just concerned with not like crashing and burning and that being the end of the show. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, um, building the jing is essential. So you can build, you're kind of simultaneously wanting to build the jing and address the candida itself to stop the jing leak. And then you can start improving at like you know, twice as fast. And Dan, what's your take on that? Yeah, hundred percent. Nervous system and adrenal support is 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 you know absolutely necessity initially before you, I think before you even go and thinking about using the the big guns, you know, to to break up the biofilms and and reduce the um, the candida load with strong antimicrobials, which are all part of the protocol. But um, it really depends on the person in front of you too. So, for example, if I've got someone who's burning the candle at both ends, doing seventy five hour work week and uh, or only wants to take antimicrobials. It's like, ha, ha, no, 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 no. We have to nail the lifestyle first. Like that is absolutely, you know, essential. Um, and so, you know, um, sleep, blue lights, EMFs, all that stuff comes into it. Diet, you have to have the foundations ready and ripe for the body to get, aha, now I can enter healing mode. Now I can switch over to parasympathetic because the foundations are there. Um, what I often do in those cases too, where someone is really on this end of the spectrum um, and, and is you know, part of that really go, go, go lifestyle is just little simple tweaks like green tea. So instead of coffee, green tea, it's, it's anti-strep, it's anti-candida, it boosts commensal bacteria, it's antioxidant, it's lymphatic. So um, little tweaks like that, you know, removing the sugars um, and then you, you sort of, you stage it out and then you might bring in a, a probiotic and you, you know, that you, you'll use a strain which has been shown to reduce fungal load and, uh, you know, boost natural killer cells and different various components of the immune system and you step it up and you step it up and you step it up and you carefully watch for reactions because that, that's another part of it with, with any sort of protocol where you are reducing uh, microbial load because you are obviously going to run into potential detoxification issues if that person's ability to clear out these metabolites can't keep up with the, the front end. Mm -hmm. So that's something you really have to be careful um, navigating. And like Sage said earlier, this can take a long time, people. This can take, if it's been there you know, a long time, it can be up to one or two years. And then once you're there, you then have to maintain um, where, where you've got to. And, and in my case, um, I got there a long time ago and then ended up um, a little while later in a, a moldy apartment over on the Northern beaches and it all went, went out the window. And so those things, those things come up. So you have to be really onto the environmental side of it too. Okay. Well, and let's just, before we move on, I want to quickly touch on um, the nervous system in supporting the nervous system to getting into that parasympathetic state so we can actually get to resting, digesting and healing. Um, some of your favorite methods, distinctions, whether they go and use, utilize technologies or whether they're just something simple that we can access through nature. Yeah. Nice one. Um, so I'm sure we've touched on it before Mason, but just, um, you know, barefoot earthing, getting, getting, back into nature, very, very simple thing to do, slowing the breathing down, doing diaphragmatic breathing, not breathing you know, shallowly from the chest uh, and doing that as often as possible, making that really, really priority. Um, I often team that up with the, the blue light blockers, which you can get now and get people to slap those on at like 7 p.m. at night, every night leading up to bed, um, switching off Wi-Fi at night. That's really good for the nervous system. So all these little tweaks to, to get you over from fight or flight over to the parasympathetic side of the nervous system. You can also pair that up with, um, you know, a few gentle botanicals like chamomile, passion flower, and reishi mushroom, for example, that trio works fantastic. Mm, yeah, I can say like a beautiful moon milk at night, maybe with a bit of a, like a, a well, I like doing a chamomile um, lavender infusion within the milk there. I've been doing that for retreaters recently and then getting those reishis in there, beautiful nightcap. 
Sage, I know that there was like a crazy crossover of what you do and love and recommend there with, <laughs> with the breath and barefoot and getting the blue light out. Um, oh, Sage, you know, one thing I'm going to have to do and put in the notes here is just get the instructions for how do people compl compl can completely get the blue light off their phone. And everyone's like, oh, night mode. It's like, no, no, no. I'm like Sage has got this yeah. beautiful hack for getting all you of the blue light deep out. In the settings, you can modify it so it goes <laughs> all red at night and you can still fully text and stuff. It gets weird if you're trying to like check out chicks on Instagram because they don't yeah. look good. And that's you, man. I imagine <laughs> it gets weird for you all night. You know? <laughs> and the blank is like, what you doing? I'm like, no, I'm just doing some looking at like photography development, old school style. So <laughs> 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 but yeah, other than that, um, it's great to be able to flip on all red at night and it's just and everything on your phone, the only colors are red and black for everything. Um, and and you, there's a shortcut you can set up to where all you have to do, and I'm not sure exactly how this um, goes on with iPhone X and, and past that where there's no home button anymore, but with the older ones, you just tap the home button three times with a shortcut and oh, wow. it'll put it right into the red. So it's easy to turn it on and off. So it's great. Uh, and then even if for some random reason you need to check the you know time in the middle of the night on your phone, it's all red. So it's mm. not, ideal not to use it at all. But uh, you know if you have to look, then at least you're not messing up your your melatonin levels and, and shocking your system in the middle of the night. And you know other things that I like for getting into that parasympathetic state would be reishi mushroom, as you mentioned, ashwagandha. Uh, is another one of my absolute favorites because it works on so many different aspects of health that people are struggling with these days. And goes um, right in that moon milk as well, that ashwagandha yeah, and reishi yeah, yeah. with that infusion. Oh man, so good. And then also uh, infrared saunas are great to put you back in that parasympathetic oh, state yeah. because you're being surrounded by the infrared, which is the heat signature that we as humans give off. That's why you look through night vision infrared goggles and you see people. So um, if you think back, and this was a theory my dad first shared with me, and this is not scientifically based necessarily, it's just, you know, a theory and you see if it resonates with you. But if you look back and when the last time was that you were fully surrounded with infrared heat in somewhat of a dark and fully safe place was in your mother's womb. Oh, and so cool. it is taking you back to that place of being fully provided for, fully safe, everything taken care of and everything's okay. All you need to do is chill out. And you know what, I'd probably put there, like putting those ocean sounds on, like I remember when, when Tani was pregnant, we were listening to the placenta and have this. Oh. So getting those, like getting those sounds in there at the same time, those ocean sounds while you're meditating in that infrared sauna. And um, we should put some links. I mean, we've got like, just here on this, um, on this call, we've got some incredible resources for people to go and get a clear light sauna. I mean, your folks, um, offer them over there in the States. And we're both friends with Sebastian here who um, owns the New Zealand, Australian and European and UK branch. So basically, no matter where you are in the world, we're going to be able to basically get you hooked we'll up. Get, and we, connections to get you a song. <laughs> yeah, we've got the connection. So basically, yeah, we'll, we'll put some links in uh, depending on which continent awesome. you're on. And, um, you know, give you some, you know, just be like, give them the old like Sage and Mason and, and Dan, let's throw Dan in there as well. <laughs> Sage Mason yeah. and Dan sent me. Um, so get you hooked up because I agree that is one of the absolute ultimate technologies, having an infrared sauna in my house for getting the nervous system toned up. And we could just do a podcast on that, I'm sure. Now, let's start. Quick, 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 if you don't mind, on the, or just to finish yeah. on the nervous system, oh, I'm yeah. also a huge fan of the Wim Hof method for this. Mm. In terms of the breathing and the super oxygenation um, for strengthening the nervous system and gently building up the cold exposure. People get intimidated because they think they got to go into these ice baths that they see people doing on Instagram in the beginning, but it's just like lifting weights. As you train your nervous system, you don't go in and do something super challenging. You don't go to try to you know, bench press 200 kilos on your first time going to the gym. You do 30 seconds of cold water at the end of a hot shower or after taking a sauna when it's, it's not going to be that crazy. And from there, you, you gently build up. Eventually you're doing 10 minutes of a cold shower or you're doing you know, a ten, five or 10 minute ice bath and it's not even that big of a deal anymore because you built up to it at a sustainable level. Of course, if you hit it too hard in the beginning, this is why people catch a cold, their nervous system's weak, they can't handle being out in the cold, they hit it all at once and it's, it overwhelms them. It's like if you try to do too much in the gym, you're gonna injure yourself, it happens. So I think that is one of the most uh, incredible tools that I've experienced um, and now that I've been doing it for uh, almost four years. Um, and it's been, yeah, so powerful for me. 
Yeah. And I think that's a good distinction there because when you look at it, when you look at the branding and you know, what works is seeing Wim walk up a mountain in his shorts um, that's covered in snow. And basically it's really important for us to remember these aren't systems of fanaticism. These are systems of appropriateness for you to build back core function. So um, I definitely throw my support um, behind that. You know, Wim's a great guy. And also for those of you that are, you know, maybe wanting to go like even deeper to, um, you know, through a process with your breath, you know, if that might be, if that might be seem a little bit unobtainable, I'll also put a link, um, Benny Ferguson, my friend, the movement monk, has a really amazing um, gentle breath work practice that is very intricate and very much takes into um, takes into account these the, the mental and physical uh, unification that's going to have to go throughout that process. So you've got lots of resources there, everyone, for um, for getting that nervous system toned. Then we start moving into how we're going to get. You know, we've got the baseline. We've got building back our gene, getting our nervous system tone. And I think we've kind of talked about it's the bread and butter. And maybe bread isn't the best example here because it has the yeast raising, you know, the, the factors that are actually <laughs> going to be implicated when it comes to candida. It's the non-starchy, gluten-free bread and butter. <laughs> mm, mm, Grass-fed butter. And there you go. Basically, now I don't want to get into where we're getting into the clearing. Now we're getting into you know, the clearing, starting bringing some herb, um, some herbals, um, start bringing in some compounds. They're going to start building back our microbiome, start, start countering um, this intense leaky gut that we can start seeing in that permeability, which we've already touched on. So Sage, you're starting out. What are your pillars for starting to clear the body and get it back on track in those initial stages, which may be for three months or a year? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it is a bit of a, a journey. And that was the most intimidating thing to me in the beginning that actually stopped me from starting it for a couple of years after I kind of knew I was going to have to do this. But I was super intimidated by the fact that I, you know, was really going to have to be serious about cutting down on carbs and sugar for anywhere from six months to two years. Mm -hmm. And I was I just I, I wanted to figure out any other way. But in the end, it just came back to this, you got to deal with these basic things. And so you want to really minimize carbs, cut out all forms of sugar because all this is feeding the candida. Eventually one day you will be able to bring it back in, in moderate amounts um, as you, as you rebuilt your whole gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. But for now um, you really want to cut it down and you're going to see tremendous ancillary benefits from this aside from just the candida. You're going to be able to start burning ketones as a, as a fuel source and burning fat. So you're, you're probably going to experience some great weight loss. A lot of people would really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And, you're going to, when you're burning these ketones for fuel and burning fat as fuel, healthy fats, you're able to actually produce far more ATP, which is your pure cellular energy, than when you're burning glucose as fuel. So you're actually going to have a lot better energy once you transition. It's a little bit, can be a little challenging as your body first is transitioning to burning fat as fuel. But once you get there, it's pretty amazing. And you'll learn to get creative and make different treats for yourself, sweetened with, you know, stevia and things like this that can can still give you the the pleasure of, of sweetness in your life you don't have to say goodbye to that mm. there's many ways you know we put tons of recipes of this kind of stuff on our, on our youtube channel and so that's the first step is cutting out all these things that are feeding the, uh, the candida and then what are you going to go after it with well one of the best uh, that i found was powdy arco tea it's one of the mm. most powerful natural antifungal herbs coming out of the amazon and so you can make a really nice tea with that it goes great as the base of any kind of hot elixir or you could just be sipping it on its own mm -hmm. all the time. And then two of the other very powerful herbs for me, the tonics that you know we all know and love are reishi mushroom and chaga. Chaga for me was especially impactful as I was, um, you know, I was doing some nice tincture, some nice capsules, but where I really started experiencing the benefits of it was when I would just get the raw chunks of chaga mushroom and cook them for three hours into a real strong water extraction, freeze it overnight so that the the water gets in inside the cell walls, these chitin cell walls that are super hard that you can't digest, actually busts them open as it freezes and expands and then boil it again the next day mm -hmm. and make this super strong and just get into drinking that regularly. And that was really a, a huge assist in my journey against Candida. So then, yeah, go for it. Oh, I'm, yeah, just getting on a roll. <laughs> so, and, well, actually, and, before before we, because I want to I want to keep yeah. it going, but I just want to I want to comment on on two things there, and um and then I and and Dan get your two cents on it. That's a really appropriate usage of the ketogenic diet. 
I really like ketogenesis as a distinction in what's in, in a way that, to get us, you know, possibly losing weight that's excessive and actually shouldn't be there. And also getting our mitochondria rocking to the extent where we can, you know, for a time get off sugars and get into this state where our metabolism can get a bit of a reset. And it's a bit of a breath of fresh air for our immune system at a time as well, rather than this go after it, get shredded, non-stop, don't ever not be keto. Um, I, I don't know what your, what your sense of that is, but I, like, I think we've, we've discussed it a couple of times on the podcast and it's, um, it's come up with one of Tani's um, uh, conversations with a practitioner in terms of like, um, and I'll put the link in that, you know, where, where like for women, an appropriate time to use ketogenesis and when it's not actually that useful. And we've spoken about it, Dan, in terms of what that excessive fat can then do to go and contribute um, over too much of a, a long period to gut permeability, thanks to the off-gassing that that um, excessive fat gives through the, from, through the bacteria. But I just wanted to really like, I like, I like that, um, that distinction you just made there, Sage. I think that's for people, for most people as a white, casting a wide net, that seems like a very sensible time to be using ketogenesis. Yeah, and I um, think, you know, there, there are anti-aging benefits of it in terms of, you know, minimizing glycation and things of that nature. Um, and I think, you know, it's a transition diet. You know, it's something you do for a time period um, to, to really change your, your inner terrain and, and your external appearance and everything. And then probably long-term more of a, a cyclical ketogenic diet is probably yeah. the more beneficial thing where you go in for a bit and you go out for a bit. And it's more of a natural, a, a natural flow. And of course, Powder Arco, I think we're three massive Powder Arco fans coming from the Lapacho tree in the Amazon, um, heavily a part of my healing protocol. Um, I hit it for probably a couple of years. I had it in constant rotation at strong amounts before it was time for me to then cycle off. Um, Eventually, you don't even want to think about it anymore. Just you hit a point where, okay, I've had enough. I'm good. Yeah, I've had it absolutely enough. And that is like, I think that's a really appropriate way to let your body govern. Like, you know, because of course with any herb and especially a herb that has strong antifungal, antimicrobial actions, you're going to want to cycle off that at some point because your body's going to want to have the breathing room to go and do its thing and regulate. So um, I just wanted to throw my like, you know, just throw my support behind those because, and you know, Powder Arco had such an incredible um such an incredible impact on me moving through. I don't think I've even mentioned the fact that I did, um, like that was my catalyst was candida and getting into this. I was had um, fungal eruptions on my skin and a suppressed immune system. And I've told the story, I think on the podcast a couple of times, um, but it was definitely for me, likewise, that combination of shaga mushroom and reishi mushroom. And then I'd use a base of powder arco tea from, you know, and that's a very, that's a very simple herbal approach. And then I had hishu wu coming in and nourishing, um, nourishing my kidneys in the beginning. And that was the beginnings for me getting off the, of course, I got off gluten. Um, I got off the grains. I got off the conventional Western diet, which is very suppressive to the spleen chi. And it definitely was to mine. And it was really suppressing my dig digestive capacity. And I was able to bounce back pretty, um, pretty quick, especially with those, those three um, primary herbs, the two mushies and um, the powder aqua bark, and then the hishu wu coming and supporting. So, um, and after I, I, I want to hear, hear all, all your awesome rambling sage, but I also just want to let everyone know we are, after this, we're going to dive into the mushies. Yeah, and then the, the, the so those are the, my first two pillars really is starve the candida and get in the beneficial herbs that are going to help clean things up in there. And then you've cleared it out. Now, what are you going to put in there? You're not just going to leave it as a blank slate and let the candida come back in all over again like you did with antibiotics. You messed up once, don't do it again. And so now we want to introduce really great bacteria into the gut. So it's good to be taking some probiotics. Um, I'm really a fan of taking spore-based probiotics or ones that are, are shown to have efficacy in actually making it through and setting up shop in the gut rather than uh, being killed off somewhere up, you know, higher up, maybe in the stomach by digestive acids and things like that. So rather than ju just looking at the number of colony forming units, which is what's most advertised, you actually have to do a little bit of deeper digging and see if the company has actually had testing done to show uh, the level of survivability, which makes a huge, huge difference. You can have a, you know, a trillion strain probiotic formula that all gets killed off in the gut and you don't get anything from it. Or you can have a 30 billion that actually all 30 billion survive and make it through and set up shop and are doing all sorts of work for you. So it really makes a big difference if it's surviving or not. And then getting onto fermented foods um, was a big part for me, you know, tons of sauerkraut, mm -hmm. fermented vegetables, um, coconut, drinking coconut water keeper was really supportive for me. 
And yeah, that, that, that was, uh, that's the fermented set of things. And those for me were the, the three main pillars. You know, a few other herbs that were beneficial were um, like occasionally using like an aged kyolic garlic extract um, was also supportive for me. One time early on, I, I heard someone say, oh yeah, you should juice a whole head of raw garlic. Candida will freak out about that. Holy crap. I had the worst burn. I like, pretty much gave myself an ulcer in the stomach from that. So don't juice a whole head of raw garlic and try drinking that. It's not a good idea. Learn from my yeah. mistake. You lose your friends. You lose <laughs> your intestinal lining. <laughs> it was painful, man. Oh, that's so good. But hey, I, I think it's awesome that everyone can learn from our fanatical mistakes. Because I've, yeah. definitely, uh, I've definitely gone down that road. Um, yeah, I love it. I love that it's simple. I love that it's methodical. And I think it's a really... I, I think there's like... Uh, over the years, I've seen that same combination coming up again and again and again when you go when you go through all the complexity and all the confusion in terms of uh, in terms of what you should and shouldn't be um, what you shouldn't shouldn't be eating and drinking. Basically, that's the, these are the core fact. These are the, the core pillars that keep on coming up in terms of what's going to get you from A to B in terms of healing as soon as possible. You mentioned body ecology. I think that's really um, uh, as well. I think you kind of consider that the Bible of an anti candida diet. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's a great place for anyone who's thinking they might be dealing with a candida issue to start out and get a good set of basic information and approaches and and what foods can be beneficial and what not and really because they'll get kind of a, a taste of things and a feel of things I think from listening to us today and get some really good ideas but it's good to have kind of a, a manual that mm. you can really pour through and refer to and that can can address it from all, all sides. So yeah, I highly recommend that anyone who thinks they may be dealing with candida read the Body Ecology Diet book. Love it, bro. Dan, what's your take when you're entering into this? What foods are you bringing in? What foods are you eliminating? Are there any distinctions in terms of particular constitutional elements that you like to take into account? Yeah, definitely. And look, I'm, I'm one of those practitioners where I probably do the least amount of dietary manipulation compared to a lot of practitioners. Um, what I typically do is, um, apart from the obvious things such as alcohol, you know, excessive caffeine use, refined sugars, um, usually if we can take dairy and gluten containing grains out of the diet and lower the amount of starches, I generally don't do too much above and beyond that in the initial stages, A, because of the amount of stress that it puts on to the patient who is already you know, you know, um, compromised to some degree um, mm -hmm. and, and under this, this, this burden of stress. And so we just want to take out the, those, those really common sort of insults to allow the inflammation to kind of just settle down in the gut. But I think probably what we um, perhaps should have mentioned a little bit earlier as well is um, just movement and sweating. And we talked about sauna, of course, but sunlight and movement are massive for candida. When I treat people um, that have chronic yeast issues, they're different people when you consider them um, and how their presentation looks in winter compared to summer. And that I attribute largely just to the upgrade they get from their immune system when vitamin D levels are optimized. Because we know that with optimized vitamin D levels, we're producing higher amounts of um, our body's own antimicrobial substances like cathelicidin, mm. which has been shown to be stronger than, you know, many, many, many botanicals when, when tested in terms of disrupting biofilms and, you know, getting viral load and bacterial load down and so forth. So um, movement's huge, you know, lymphatic detoxification, that's massive as well. And so to ensure the person is moving and sweating and getting adequate sunlight, um, you know, it's dry skin brushing, mm -hmm. simple, but really, really effective as well. Um, but at that particular sort of point in treatment, I like to then, um, depending on the person's constitution, introduce some gentle biofilm disruptors as well, because it's one thing mm. to bring in antifungal herbs, but if the immune system can't see them and if the, the, the shell of these critters isn't cracked up and to allow their contents to be exposed to these botanicals or our immune system, then we're kind of not getting as much bang for our buck. So um, compounds like N-acetylcysteine, absolutely brilliant for, for cracking up biofilm, really good for supporting um, the liver as well and glut glutathione production, which is our body's um, master antioxidant. And you want prime levels of that anytime you're doing any sort of, um, you know, changes to the, to the gut ecosystem or, or detoxification. <clears throat> um, the good old Podiaco, po sorry, Podiaco and cat's claw tea combo, I've found to be personally really successful. And I think that's probably one of the first things you and I ever jammed about back at the mm -hmm. 
the markets years ago. Yeah, man, um, for sure. And I think I think Sage, I can attest to Sage's love for Cat's Claw and Yudagato as well. Everyone's oh, yeah. like, oh my gosh, you guys are reading Cat's Claws. It's just a bark, everybody. I've got to just mention <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I get that every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Dan. Sorry, yeah. just like I had to get that little joke in there. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah, in, in addition to, to that, um, pomegranate tincture I have found to be just absolutely magnificent when it comes to yeah. any sort of pathogenic overgrowth. I can't speak highly enough about that particular herb. Um, I haven't found any other botanicals that simultaneously lower you know, things like bacteria and candida whilst upregulating good bacteria at the same time. So um, pomegranate tincture is definitely going into, you know, a part of the protocol for anyone who has any sort of, you know, fungal um, overgrowth. Um, apart from that, like once you're doing all the, the biofilm work, the person's moving and sweating, the vitamin D is optimized and the, the dietary foundations are on point. You do have to think about um, the liver and all the metabolites that you're breaking down because the liver ultimately has the job of, of buffering and, and, and keeping that oil clean. Mm. Um, and again, that, that feeds back into using things like N acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, um, good old Shizandra and St. Mary's thistle, mm -hmm. burdock, dandelion root, just as teas can be really, really pivotal as well. So just um, garbage in, garbage out. Just get people thinking about the, the more you're, you're killing off um, and the debris you're producing that has to be exiting the system because you can get that enterohepatic recirculation and you don't want that because the bugs will just set up shop in a different area in the body. So can I just, I'm just going to, before we, before we move on, I really just want to bring a summary to this aspect of treatment where we've identified that we perhaps we do have an overgrowth of candida. We get into the, the tweakings of the diet, whether we do it gently. And I would, I would agree that it's like, it's psycholo it's a psychological conversation of whether someone's going to go down like the hardcore, um, like phase two body ecology when it's like no sugars whatsoever, maybe some green apple. I think yeah, it phase, is phase one is the full intensity phase one. And then mm -hmm. phase two is like gentler as you're, as you've gotten better, but phase, yeah, phase one is the full intensity. And like, and also just making distinct what Dan was saying there, like, you know, what are the, you know, what are the core things that I'd be introducing if, you know, if they're in a state where it's just not possible for them to make those changes. And that would be, you know, like, which, you know, again, whether it's going to work or not, th these are like, this is what everyone's going to have to have that real dance within themselves. I like, I, I think that's safe to say, um, and what's possible for you. And then you're going to have to manage your expectations with that. But especially what you said, Dan, you know, getting, um, I don't know, like what were you saying dietarily with your core, you know, like refined grains, um, especially like ex excessive sugars, definitely getting off processed sugars. I think that's, if you're on processed sugars, I think you're going to basically be shooting yourself in the, in the candida foot every single time you try and jump ahead. So we've got that aspect, you know, the possible looking at ketogenesis for a, for a particular time. And so basically we've got that dietary component. Um, we're, we're then talking, um, you know, within a herbal sense um, and, uh, and a treatment sense of getting our nervous system really toned and getting us in a calm place where we, our body can actually heal, getting our foundations of our Jing through Jing herbs, like you mentioned, uh, Hishawu, Ramania, Cordyceps, uh, Eucomia bark, and I think you mentioned Sustanch as well. Um, yeah. Sage and you know also you're going to get a good cross over there um, and you don't have to have all of these you pick your you know you pick your herb and ashwagandha is also a beautiful one there that's going to have those you know those dual effects on the nervous system and on the, the kidneys then we've gone to talking about right what herbs are we starting to include and what supplements are we starting to include to actually start clearing these out medicinal mushrooms we're going to go into next but that's a huge aspect of building up basically the jing of the immune system which is always implicated i can definitely always like well definitely always that's never the case but i can generally say that you're going to see an immune suppression when it comes to candida i think that's a fair thing to say would you guys agree absolutely yeah it leaves and, you very vulnerable to other things happening and, and taking place absolutely so then we see both of your suggestions in terms of what we're going to be getting uh, coming in we're going to get the herbs like pata arco the shagas the reishis um you know my takis and turkey tails are always going to be wonderful bringing those in to fortify the immune system and then you know you've talked about n acetylcysteine um and started talking about this other aspect of this phase which um sage i know you're all over and uh, let's now that we're now that we're here um and dan i really appreciate you bringing up the biofilms 
the ability for us to actually break down. Um, and I don't know where, like where you're at in terms of, you know, just describing what these biofilms actually are. I know there's a bit of calcification involved in them. And I know the immune system especially has a hard time identifying that there is something there behind this little encasing or this little barnacle in which the infection lies beneath. It's one of the, it's one of its survival opportunistic mechanisms to not become identified by the immune system. And at that time, so I just want to talk just a little bit more on that stage within this protocol of actually knocking out these biofilms so our immune system can start getting this candida infection under control. So I just want to reiterate your favorites for breaking down um, these biofilms. And then I just want to have another quick little conversation around opening up detox channels, supporting liver, and also my favorite, in including binders like clays within the diet to help moving these things out. And then also inclusive in this conversation is going to be the saunas. We don't have to go too much um, further into it, but if you got that going on, you're going to be definitely opening up that channel of detoxification through the skin. So in terms of knocking out these biofilms, um, your faves, Dan? Pomegranate, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Um, and acetylcysteine, as we mentioned, and another one um, from the silkworm, serapeptase, which I'm sure you guys are probably quite familiar with as well. Um, yeah, and another, absolutely. Another big favorite. Yeah. The only caution with serapeptase is long term, it can, um, let me rewind a little bit, good bacteria as well do form biofilm. And so there is a concern that long term use of agents like serapeptase and acetylcysteine can also um, crack up good biofilms, um, which you don't want. Mm. And that's like, it's natural with anything that's a treatment protocol or like enzymes therapy with the serum peptase, you want to, you want to make sure that you're cycling and, and respecting the treatment period and you're not exactly. going in and altering the ecosystem of the body too long term. Would you, um, would you like the use of MSM in there? Have you ever found that useful? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do like MSM and that's a big one I'll use in conjunction um, with this protocol, particularly if people have um, joint related issues, which, which as Sage said, we often see that with, with candida is that these fungal metabolites get float, you know, passed around and float around through the body um, and can cause quite um, really painful and swollen joints as well as, mm. as brain fog. And that's another thing with brain fog, the, um, the components that get broken up with, um, with, with candida compounds actually form acid aldehyde. And that's why you get people that say, I feel like I'm drunk. I'll go to work and I just feel like I'm, I'm wasted. I can't think mm -hmm. properly. You know, my short term memory has gone. And that's because of this acid aldehyde that the candida produce. Um, so yeah, sorry, kind of went off on a little t tangent there, but it's always really funny when you see those news articles of people who they found had so much fermentation going on in the gut, they were tested to be drunk and, and they had <laughs> any, any, any alcohol at all. It's, yeah. it's so <laughs> bizarre, but it's, it's, uh, it's true life. Yeah. Yeah. Next, next thing we know, they'll be pull, pulled over and getting uh, random breath tested and, and being fine. <laughs> just having, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, Soon enough, you want to get tested for candida, get pulled over and the cops test you. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Imagine we get to the point where like, we're really concerned of the immunological like health of our population, random candida testing everybody, you know, kind of like pull, pull over, you know, like parasite testing, you know, we just, you know, we candida just got your back, everyone. Concerned, you're driving safety. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Do not operate machinery oh, yeah. while candida is present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to summarize, N-acetylcysteine, serapeptase, um, the pomegranate, good old green tea. Um, sounds very boring and we're, we're used to hearing that, but that is so, so good I've found for, for candida in particular. Mm. Um, we can talk about things like lauric acid and caprylic acid. They're, they're often good additions to do, particularly in those really stubborn cases. Um, mm. The other one I didn't mention is berberine. Berberine's really, really um, efficient at cracking up biofilms and getting on top of and this is what I love about herbal medicine. It's like we're, we're isolating candida, but we know we're going to have a good effect on viruses and bacteria at the same time. So if someone does come in and they've got known candida issues, but they also have SIBO, we know that using agents like berberine and pomegranate, we're, we're hitting both on the, on the same head. That makes mm. sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, a little 
Yeah, I mean, it gets a little bit different when you're using herbals rather than, um, than isolate. So um, beautiful list there, Dan. I really appreciate it. I really like the serum peptase MSM combination for breaking down those biofilms. I'm definitely going to have to get a little bit more into, into pomegranate and um, definitely throw my sport behind the berberine. Um, mm. Sage, in terms of breaking down the, the biofilms, you've mentioned the, um, the immunological aspect of, you know, actually being able to then, you know, through the mushrooms, get underneath those biofilms and clear out the fungus. What's your, um, what's your favorite ways of breaking down that encasing layer? of the I'm, I'm very similar to Dan here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of serapeptase uh, and not just for this application, but also others of, you know, many friends who I've shared it with have had tremendous results in terms of clearing up scar tissues and, and clearing up calcifications and mm -hmm. clearing up like cysts that would not go away and, and ovarian cysts and things like this. It's been so cool to see how, how much benefit people have gotten from it. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people try serapeptase and other forms of, of systemic proteolytic enzymes and they're just not doing it right so they don't get the results. I think it's kind of something where for a short to medium term period, like Dan said, not, not long term, short to medium term, you wanna basically take as much as you can afford. Um, if that's two capsules a day, fine. If that's five, fine. If it's 10, okay, now we're, now we're talking. Um, and you want to have it with a lot of water on a totally empty stomach and just kind of lie down and be still for a while and let them do their work. And that's when you can get the real magic of these systemic enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, as, as you were mentioning, like pomegranate's great, N-acetylcysteine, awesome. Berberine, I think, does not get nearly enough credit for what a powerful no. compound. Is for those who don't know, it's an extract from various plants it can come from, most commonly from the Indian barberry. And it is so great at killing off all, all kinds of bad bacteria and, and fungus and things like this in the gut, as well as uh, helping with the biofilms. I didn't personally, um, it didn't come into my awareness until after I was kind of already on the other side of my candida journey. Uh, but I sure wish I'd had it and had access to it at the time. And it's so good for overall uh, blood glucose blood glucose and blood sugar balance, um, it's actually shown to be just as effective, if not more effective uh, than metformin, which is the most common uh, diabetes drug. So, so good all around. So good. I think everyone's got like, I think we've just, I, I, I like that that wasn't an excessive list. I, I find that would be, you know, I like having a supplement ceremony in the morning. That's how I can really get my head around ensuring that I don't feel like I'm feeding this sickness psychology or mentality because that's one of the things that's going to get your feet stuck in the mud. And when you relate to yourself as like, look, that's it. I've got candida and I'm sick and I have to take all these things because I'm sick. I like to have a little ceremony where I, I can pause. I've got, you know, in the beginning, I might have it all written down what my intention is behind each supplement, just so I can connect to it just for a moment. That way there's that subtle activation of the placebo where your whole body is engaged and opening up to utilizing it. And you can also feel whether it's working for you or not a little bit more in that way. So I think a beautiful list, guys, in terms of um, then supporting, you know, Dan, bringing up the, the supporting of the liver. And then I really want to throw in that, like what was always useful for me is a binder. Um, I like clays. I like getting a, diff um, a number of different type of dietary clays of different colors from different places. But the easiest for everyone, I think the same in the US, Sage, to um, access bentonite clay. Yeah, bentonite clay and, and also um, activated charcoal is, I think, another mm. one really mm. worthwhile taking into consideration. I, I think especially during high um, periods of high die off, if you're experiencing those high levels of detoxification, I would like, for me, I, I just, I can't do charcoal more than a week. Okay. Um, um, but I think, I think you're right. Like there are, there are folks who don't tend towards a dry kind of constitution, whereas I can go to a little bit more of a dry constitution. And I can feel that I do get um, dried out if, no matter how much water I have with charcoal, but I will definitely throw like, my, ex I, I completely agree. Those and periods will find the balance of, of how much works for them and, and they can go by feel. Well, exactly. But I, I mean, like clays, you know, I get my clay, I put it in a bit of water and I leave it overnight. And I like, this is generally a part of my rotating diet, letting it soak and rehydrate. And I get up in the morning and I generally will drink like roughly a liter of spring water when I first get up and then I'll throw my clay down. Um, just knowing that that's going to be getting in and binding to anything gnarly that's in my, um, that my metabolism has created that might be a little bit of like just assisting my body's um, waste processes to get that out. Um, I, I'm a big fan of it. Um, how, and how it, thick is it when you mix it up? Is it like, are you like you eating with a spoon or, or is it drinking or how do you? It's probably, it's on the, it's probably on the, on the edge of sludge, but I'm able to drink it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, quite often, you know, what I've, what I've done and I've just finished a retreat and what we were doing is we were making a base tea of um, powder arco and cat's claw. And we were using that as what we were hydrating the clay in overnight. And then we'd get that out, you know, that would be their shot in the morning. And so nice. you'd have all those antiviral, and antimicrobial, antibacterial um, compounds moving through the body at the same time. And we were also, because, you know, because in that instance, their body began to release quite a bit. Um, I also use powdered zeolites, Australian zeolites. I think we've all used them quite extensively. Um, but between those, um, between those three binders, between charcoal, zeolite and clay, you've got some good choices there. Do you use those at all clinically, Dan? Uh, yeah, I do. And I've got a couple others um, to throw in as well. Um, slippery elm is, is really, really beneficial there. And you get the added bonus that not only are you soaking up those debris, but you're also giving um, fermentable substrates to commensal bacteria in the gut, which we know if candida is present are going to be you know, quite suppressed and, and have taken a hit. Um, soak chia seed is, is awesome too. You know, super simple. You can do it at home. Soak chia mm -hmm. seed, wait, wait till it forms that beautiful gelatinous substance. Um, and, and use that daily. And then chlorella. Um, good old chlorella is, is fantastic and um, really good affinity for heavy metals too. That's another thing with heavy metals and candida. I often find that they'll go hand in hand, um, particularly if there is a lead or, or mercury or aluminium load, knowing that that's going to suppress the immune system, you're going to have a limited response um, to a lot of treatment until you deal with those heavy metals and take the burden off the immune system bring it back online and then try, um, you know, the, the immunomodulating compounds along with the anti antibacterial herbs and, and so forth. And you get a lot more bang for your buck there. Mm. And um, so do you want to hand over to you in a second? Cause I know your eyes lit up when you mentioned chlorella. Um, but I, <laughs> I um, just want to, just want to reiterate to everyone that when you're getting all of this thrown at you, it can seem like this one huge list of everything you need to take is just starting to dominate your world. And that's why, um, of course, there's cross-pollination of all these things in what they're doing into the, in, in the body. But I find it very useful to start to somewhat compartmentalize mm. intentions in this healing process so that you can start to really wrap your head and your heart around it. And so that's that, that binding and chelating category that we're talking about now, if you can you know, if you can have that somewhat, you know, isolated into, into your lifestyle flow and your daily dietary flow, where you have a, you know, a particular shot, you might be having your clays with your zeolites, um, then, you know, bang, you can have your, your little shot of chlorella and then you can start, you know, at the same time layering in like these little like, right, you know, in the beginning, I'm going to be knocking out these biofilms because I think that is something that you can be doing in the beginning. You know, you can have that little, that ceremony as Sage was talking about when you get into taking your capsules, you may be taking your, you know, you might be like really focusing on that serum peptase and you go, great, I'm going to have my tan and I'm just going to take a little moment and let those enzymatic catalysts go in and do their thing. And then, you can like be like, what else is achievable for you? All right, I can take a little N-acetylcysteine or I can take a berberine. Great, I can, I can include that. And I know that's like, it's cellular rejuvenation. It's supporting the body to, um, to really get in and um, get these detoxification pathways rocking and identifying these, um, these biofilms so the body can really start seeing what's going on um, immunologically and within, with candida at the same time. And just these little things, I mean, like, I feel like we're, we're, gonna, we're not just leaving you high and dry here. When it gets confusing, I mean, I'm sure it, we're, we're happy for you to reach out to any of us because we want to make sure this is a very accessible and doesn't get overwhelming. Just acknowledge there's, yes, there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to learn about your body and the way it works. And this is in fact a wonderful calling for you to start digging in and understanding these various processes within the body and how we have this, plethora of, of compounds and technologies and this apothecary just at the tips of our fingers that can really support us um, in this when our intention is strong and we just do that little bit of extra research and make sure that we're really hitting in the right places at the right time. But Sage, do you want to throw any, any two cents behind um, chlorella? Oh yeah, I just, I love chlorella in, in so <laughs> many ways. I'm, I'm having pretty much a tablespoon every day forever. <laughs> Um, whether it's the, the tablets and just chewing on those. Um, and those do get stuck in your teeth when you chew on them. But interestingly, chocolate gets them out of your teeth so perfectly. You have one piece of chocolate <laughs> so and good. somehow it kind of lubricates them out where they could be stuck in your teeth for hours otherwise. Um, <laughs> I'm crazy about chlorella from it being such a great source of protein to being uh, 
10% uh, chlorophyll by dry weight um, to it having this property of chlorella growth factor um, mm -hmm. where it causes the beneficial bacteria in your gut to multiply at a faster rate. And it's also the fastest growing food crop in the entire world. I believe it um, quadruples every 24 hours, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly. Mm. And then also it's incredibly high in RNA. So it's actually the highest natural food source of RNA. Previously, they thought uh, that it was coming from oysters. Um, and it was, they would always say, oh yeah, oysters, this is the highest natural source of RNA. Chlorella mm. absolutely blows it out of the water um, by, by many times. So it's such a spectacular food and a great binder and detoxifier as well as Dan was saying. For me, it's just kind of part of my program that is my long-term detoxification strategy that's just mm -hmm. ongoing because we live in, in a weird world with lots of toxicity, especially being in a big city here, always being exposed to all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to have just ongoing as your insurance policy. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, look, moving on to the liver, I just want to generally, we have to talk about if we're talking about healing strategies, we need to talk about supporting the liver. And so everyone can start entering into this encapsulation or if you're taking notes, right? Okay. The liver work. So you've already mentioned the, um, you know, I think you've mentioned kind of like the dandy blend, right? So getting onto the dandy lime, um, you know, that can just, you can just be brewing that up as a tea to the, you know, like with the powder Arco and have your, you know, add your, add in your medicinal mushrooms and boom, you've got that, you know, that burdock and, you know, you've got that, that dandelion, that beautiful liver nourishment going in, in a very sustainable way. Now, additionally, I've always got Shazandra in on these protocols. Now I found the easiest way for me to include it where it's not like bundling up in that morning um, supplement and, and, um, and that morning tonic protocol, I, rather than just as well as having a smoothie and throwing everything in there, um, I don't know where your, what your take is on it. I generally don't love people in these times when we're clearly seeing a uh, spleen chi deficiency. I don't like throwing a high amount of wet, hard to digest, often cold compounds into a smoothie and just knocking that back. I prefer, I pref, um, prefer the diet to be um, non-damp forming and um, very nourishing. And also not, um, I definitely also want to make sure that it's not getting in there and aggravating any, any heat. And so I don't like, you know, I think this is a, this is a casting a wide net, but just to backtrack and talk about that dietarily, you can, you can start to look from an Ayurvedic or a TCM um, perspective, what's really going to, what foods are going to be really contributing to weakening my spleen chi and what's going to support my spleen and be able to get back on top and becoming nourished. And so um, to an extent, easy to digest foods with just that little bit of testing, you know, with the fibers, um, I think is a really, um, really appropriate way to uh, go about it. But with the Shazandra, I love having an afternoon chi when it comes to my shizandra, I put a big, like a, you know, start with a quarter teaspoon. Maybe it's just half you, but I like putting a teaspoon of shizandra extract in just hot water. And that really gets me through the afternoon. It can be another great way for you to be supporting your, um, uh, your liver. Uh, Sage, anything else you want to throw in on that? Yeah, shizandra is so nice as a stage one and stage two liver detoxifier. And I think this is an area where, and in many areas, but I think here is one where people could really benefit from having some genetic testing done. It's so affordable these days in terms of being able to do just like a $100 uh, 23andMe genetic test. And you get some of your genetic information regarding, well, here's how you do it. You get the ancestry test with them. Don't do the health test with them because the health information they give you is not very insightful. And then you take the information from them and there's various sites like Prometheus um, or, or uh, Found My Fitness also has some good analyses and you upload your raw data to those sites and they provide you for like 10 bucks, a really in-depth analysis that you can actually get some real wisdom and personal insight from. And why that specifically applies here is because you wanna know hey, how your genetics are around liver detoxification. Some people will have better stage one and worse stage two or vice versa. And you need to know, and that will kind of guide you in terms of what you need to be taking to support a certain component of your liver detoxification rather than another. So good. Dan, I know you're into it as well. What's your two cents on that? Yeah, Sage, I'm one of those, exactly one of those people. Really awesome at phase one, terrible at phase two. So oh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, couldn't recommend that, that anymore. And um, getting those little snips is, is really pivotal, I find, because um, a lot of people can be working for a long time at these, these issues and getting better, but not really getting optimum. And then I find the genetic testing for those 
types of folks um, can often be just the, the cream on the cake um, and it can often provide what they're looking for to go, hey, I'm not producing like hardly any glutathione. I really need to, to target that. Like that needs to be forefront before I do any of this. I need to upregulate glutathione and, and phase two. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, but yeah, on to phase one and phase two. That's a really important um, thing to bring up, I think, because a lot of folks... Um, a lot of folks don't know that you, you need nutrition to, f to perform adequate liver detox. So often we get in the, the sort of mindset that, hey, I'm going to use this plant or this compound or this binder and that's going to detox me. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. But that kind of comes later. Your, your liver has to package up and break down these metabolites in order for those binders to, to grab onto and to, and to bring out of the system. And so for phase one, for example, you need your, your, your B vitamins and, and different sorts of minerals in order to do that. So if, you, if you've got malabsorption or if you're deficient, a lot of your metabolites aren't even getting broken down adequately. And then you're creating lots of oxidative stress. And then other folks like myself, you can do that job really well, but you can't transform them very well over to phase two, which is kind of like where the, the liver packages, packages them up and sits them there waiting for the, the bus to come through and, and, and pick it up, which is like the binder. And that's where compounds like Shizandra, Sage mentioned, um, turmeric, broccoli sprout extracts and, and other agents are really good at um, upregulating phase two enzymes. And then phase three, which we, we coin now, um, and that's kind of really coming to the forefront because for a, for a long time, it was just phase one and phase two. Phase three is like that bus that comes along and picks up the, the garbage and takes it out of, the, out of the system. And that's where the, the binders and the charcoals and the clays um, are really valid. But yeah, nailing those, those first two sort of upstream phases is very critical and gets overlooked quite a bit, I find. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, though, like we, we love going upstream, and I think that's like we, you know, I, I'm loving this. We're creating this like this whole huge world. I will just throw it behind everyone again. I remember being in that place when I was hearing this all for the first time and going, shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? What the hell? So, you know, I just want to remind everyone there's lots of there's lots of show notes, you know, there's like, you know, and we're, we're, we're accessible. I'd really recommend to listen back to this podcast again. If you're implicated, if you're not just curious about this, but you've got some work, if you're realizing you've got some work to be done, at the same time, this isn't just a protocol for Candida. As you can see, we're working on the entire environment through this. You're going to see a lot of crossover with generally upgrading and cleansing the body. And I think there's a really sensible way to do it. Just before we move on to mushrooms, and I know I've said that a lot, um, I just, if you if you swing that, that traditional Chinese medicine route, if you're working with a TCM practitioner, um, again, I come at it from more of a Taoist perspective. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like a hobbyist when it comes to TCM. So this is an ex, this is an expert recommendations, but if you're working with someone and you want to get some, you know, you, or you've got access to herbal formulas, basically in this cleansing period, when you're removing the waste from the body, in terms of, um, in terms of what you want to be doing in supporting the triple burner, get itself back and track because it's often a triple burner um, factor when it comes to candida from what I can tell. We're going to see an immediate um, implement, implement, um, implication in the lower burner and so these are the symptoms like, uh, you know, vaginal excretions, um, you know, so, you know, and, and just basically along that line, you're going to see dampness. Um, you're going to also want to see that you are expelling phlegm and heat from the body. And so that's what you're going to be going, leaning towards, like, especially if it's that you're getting those lower symptoms. Damp heat clearing formula is one that I know is used quite successfully. Um, it's got gentian and um, skull cap and, Gardenia, um, Bipleurium, Romania. So that's very useful, especially if it's in that lower burner. And then a little bit higher if you're trying to like really work that upper burner and the middle burner symptoms. Um, so that's what coming up to the spleen, you know, really like you know, dampness within the spleen or like low, um, definitely a, a, a low chi function with the spleen and then implication in the lungs. Um, Copsis formula is also used. So Copsis and... Um, gardenia again and angelica and chrysanthemum and um, a bunch of other wonderful herbs going on there just in case you you swing in that direction and you wanted to get some just like you know some some pointers um now can you take medicinal mushrooms if you have candida sage 
<laughs> you better take them. You better. If you want to see some real improvement, you better. So this is the question that I know you guys get all the time. I get all the time. Absolutely. It's such a silly concept that's been spread around that because you have a form of bad fungus run amok in your body that you should not introduce any form, other higher forms of fungi into your body. Now, while you may want to avoid ground mushrooms like portobello mushrooms, button mushrooms, and things like this that are often contaminated with mold and therefore would be really problematic, these mushrooms are mushrooms that grow on trees. These are medicinal mushrooms. These are mushrooms that ideally are grown in a very clean format, and they are going to give your immune system the power and the education and the weaponry and the potential to go in and bring things back into balance in your body. They're enhancing your immune system's own natural intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, if your phone doesn't have the tools it needs, then maybe you need an operating system upgrade. This is the, this is the operating system upgrade for your immune system to give it the new tools to work with. So good. What are your faves? What do you, you, you've mentioned Shaga and Reishi. They were, they were pivotal in your yeah, healing Reishi journey. Yeah, Reishi and Shaga. Um, cordyceps I love as well for many things, although I don't find it to be as powerful, uh, particularly in the Candida realm. Uh, mm. Reishi and Shaga, specifically very strong Chaga. Mm. Uh, e, making it on my own uh, it was, was super helpful um, for me. And then, of course, you have things like uh, Turkey Tail and Maitake, especially if you can get uh, the Maitake defraction as a supplement. That's very um, potent, but for me, the biggest game changer in, in my experience was chaga. But of course, everybody's body is a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, so it, it may be different for others. What about you, Dan? Uh, in terms of mushrooms, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Coriolis, turkey tail, maitake, and I, I think using using a good compound of all those things, like something like you know Mason's mushrooms, for example. Um, there's some other practitioner brands with brands that which had um, really good combinations of, of four or five different types of fungus um which i'd recommend yeah but going going back to that original question of can you use them an analogy i often like to use including when i get asked that question is you know if we have a bacterial overgrowth we're going in there with bacteria aren't we probiotics you know because mm -hmm. they can conquer the higher classes like sage said so it's the same principle with fungus really we're mm -hmm. using superior fungus to conquer to combat lower grade fungus basically and we know that medicinal mushrooms in the wild do this so that, that is a really, um, you know, useful kind of um, note to, to pass on to, to people that, that, that are a little bit confused around that. Yeah, and I think it comes up heavily because the culinary mushrooms is what everyone talks about. When if someone mentions a mushroom, they think they're talking about buttons and, you know, brown buttons and portobellos and those ones you're going to buy in the store. Um, fair enough. We haven't really been exposed to buying reishi mushroom and lion's mane at the grocery. And there's no distinction that there are, in fact... Just like the plant kingdom, there are, uh, and I think I heard you mention this recently, Sage, it was a really nice distinction. You know, there's not just one type of plant. There is an incredible, almost infinite amount of expressions in that plant kingdom. And likewise, in the fungal kingdom, we see the exact same thing. And so we're talking about a particular- Same in the animal kingdom. Like yeah. if, if, you ha if there's a human who's misbehaving, you're not going to say, oh, don't send a human to go set them straight because they're just a human. They're going to make the problem worse. No, you send it to go compassionately kind of interact with them and see what the deal is and get them into some neurofeedback or something. Very good, Sage. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so naturally, I think, um, I don't know whether you're at in terms of agreeance in whether, um, whether you do leave out those, um, those soil-borne mushrooms from a candida diet. I definitely think it's something that I would be doing is leaving out those button mushrooms and those soil-borne mushrooms. And um, I can let everyone know that they are nodding. So we, we have, we have nods All in support. <laughs> and, um, a number of like, I've seen a couple of theories on this. I see that you get a little bit, we talked about this previously, Dan, with in the gut podcast, there can become molecular mimicry. And so there's such a similarity between that kind of yeast expression, those yeast cells within these soil born mushrooms and culinary mushies that it's, um, so similar to the candida and the yeast infection that in fact, the immune system can get a little bit more confused in that light. But I've also seen people talking about the fact that these uh, culinary mushrooms fight for the food sources with the candida and can be beneficial. I haven't seen anything really backing that up or you know, showing that that's true in any way. I don't know if either of you have seen anything like that, testing to that. Mm, that's a, I, I, yeah, I can't say that I have, so I'm not, not fully confident to, um, yeah, to, to go into that. I don't know about you, Sage. No, me neither. Me neither. 
No, and I, I, I kind of, I had rustled around for quite a bit and couldn't find anything. It was all anecdotal. Um, and so that is something I would leave out of the eye. But when it comes to the medicinal mushrooms, we are definitely seeing a different kettle of fish in the mushroom kingdom. We're definitely mm. seeing um, an incredible increase of, you know, one directly um, implicated aspects of the immune system is the macrophage activity activation that is straight away is going to assist your body on an immunological level, kind of start you like kind of like an internal binding or an internal detoxification protocol um, for your, your macrophage activity to get in there to this candida albicans and start moving it out. Um, but at the same time, we see such a flurry of activation, um, but not purely a stimulation when it comes to using our shagas, reishis, maitakis, lion's manes, and turkey tails. We don't just see this stimulation in the immune system as we know, but generally, we're going to see the immune system seemingly go towards that stimulated direction when candida is the infection because naturally we're going to have a deficiency of the immune system. And so I agree, you better be taking them, Sage, when you said it came out like that firing. It's something where I, I don't think it makes sense not to include it in the diet when you're going down the road of, um, the road of this protocol. And then of course, we see such a flurry of other activity with the, you know, we've already, we've already talked about reishi mushroom getting in there and helping to tone the nervous system, um, tone the mind in terms of it being a shen tonic and the way the Taoist approach it. Um, you see lots of physiological function and de-stressing the body so that the mind body connection can then emerge and we can get uh, a calmer state of mind and we can get into a calmer state of being throughout the day, which ties straight back in with our original intention is remaining within that place where we can breathe deeply and we can ensure that we're staying in a healing space. But then you go, you know, we can go even further with the medicinal mushrooms that, you know, we, we the, the science is coming out more and more about how we are hardwired for a lot of these compounds with the particular, these um, fungal um, polysaccharides within the mushrooms. And so as an inherent part of our um, of the way our immune system is involved, um, again, you've got to throw your support behind um, behind using them. Anyone want to throw any other little two cents about the the usefulness of medicinal mushrooms, their immune modulating aspects, and just because we got in this intelligence. I remember like really relating to shaga and reishi in particular, being and and lion's mane and turkey tail being these noble thought forms within the fungal, um, fungal system and somewhat understanding the psychology of these um, lower forms of fungus, you know, just to put a hierarchy on it, um, you know, just take that with a grain of salt, being able to somewhat uh, in, enable the immune system just the way the mushrooms have had to adapt and evolve to not become um, infected by yeast themselves as they're growing through the environment pass on that information to our body so we can in fact also not be broken down by these environmental yeasts any other little things you um, either of you would like to throw in um you know just interesting distinctions about why mushies might be useful um i would probably just highlight um the fact that i, th I think i think medicinal mushrooms still get thought of largely as immune specific compounds mm. so we have you know um dandelion and burdock they're really everyone thinks liver you know and we have these different affiliations and associations with herbs but it's i think branding. it's important to yeah exactly i think it's important to um relate to them not only in, in an immunological way and to think of them as endocrine modulators and that's what you need. And that's going back to what we said earlier about resetting the nervous system before the healing can take place. So not only are you upgrading your immune system, it's really acting on that endocrine system to, to get you into, you know, um, a really uh, fortified and, and pivotal kind of state where, where the candida can start coming down. You, you're acting on it immunologically, but you've got endocrine balance happening at the same time. So just get your mind in your herbs too and think about that, um, in, in terms of the stages that you roll these things out. So it's like, okay, for the next week or two, we're, we're going really hard on medicinal mushrooms for these reasons. And then following that, we're going to really go into the liver. And um, I really like that with, um, with herbal medicine, particularly for folks who haven't used them before, to really get people's minds in their herbs, <laughs> as trippy and spiritual as that sounds. Mm, not at all. Uh, yeah. Um, just to, yeah, like, you know, we, we grow up with pharmaceutical uh, medicine, with Western medicine, and it's kind of like you, you're sick, you go and visit the doctor, you take something, your mind is out of that equation, you don't know how it's acting, all you're waiting for is to see if the result is there and, and you get, you know, quote unquote better. But with herbal medicines, I think it's really important to know what the herbs are doing and to educate 
folks on that and roll that out in different stages so then they know at what time they can expect you know symptoms to 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 be felt and 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 know when to proceed into other areas as well um so yeah i mean i don't know if i answered the the question um no question just any additional thoughts and i I agree i mean i haven't gone so much into the pharmaceutical um application i mean like i know practitioners have a hard time with fungus because they have such a wide array of antibacterial um anti um antibacterials that they can that they can be using uh, antibiotics that they can be using and so basically they can just jump and round and try and find the one that's right for a particular infliction but they don't have many antifungals and in fact candida albicans is becoming more and more resistant to the pharmaceutical antifungals that are occurring and mm. i think the like one of the areas that the current research is going on with an isolated um, pharmaceutical is um inhibiting the um the the tor of um the 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 tor pathways of the um candida albicans which inhibits its ability to then proliferate um Mm. again you know it seems like it's going to be useful in a clinical setting and it's nice to hone in but how much do you hone in before that treatment isn't going to be then unified with the rest of the treatment setting that's going to lead you down a path where you've created an environment where your body can do the regulation itself without yeah. too much of an isolated drug-based effect. So yeah, I um, completely agree with everything you said. Sage? Yeah, one other thing there um, on the pharmaceutical side of things, because sometimes life circumstances will happen where you just can't get around taking antibiotics. Things happen. Hmm. It's, a, it's a bizarre world we live in. Um, something to keep in mind and talk with your doctor about if that does come up is there's a, a supplement or not a supplement, a, a pharmaceutical called Nystatin, which mm. uh, is, is a statin drug, but it also has very powerful antifungal properties. And so many people see a lot of benefit from taking liquid Nystatin at the same time as the antibiotics to keep the candida at bay, keep the fungal problems from, from yeah. coming on board. That's common practice, right? Very interesting. Nobody does it. Like, you know, like, don't you like I've, I've had a bunch of people or maybe it's just because we're in byron i've had a bunch of people put within that you know or like or i guess here like we have a emergency Are people more aware of it there in byron about the nice statin i think so i mean i've i've, 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 I've definitely heard yeah i've mean, definitely had a lot of people um here been put on an like you know put on a, i didn't realize it was a statin but an antifungal at the same time along with yeah. their um antibiotic um, but yeah, at the same time, we've got an emergency room here that actually acknowledges that Lyme disease exists. So we're in a, <laughs> yes, we're a different a, world. Yeah, we're in a different world. Like, you know, when I went with my my Esha, you know, like my, my rash around my tick bite, he was like, oh yeah, that's Lyme. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even have to fight. <laughs> right wow. around that. Mm. But um, so, I mean, anything else, Sage, you wanted to add around medicinal mushrooms or are you feeling sweet on that topic? No, they're, they're fabulous. They're magical, even though they're not psychedelic. And uh, I love them very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're psychedelic well. for the immune system and the immune system starts singing when all of a sudden you get some, again, it's the unification of the immune system. And what I like about medicinal mushrooms is we're, we're really been talking about this treatment setting and this treatment protocol where we're healing ourselves through um, you know, dietary changes, maybe a time on ketogenesis, a time on uh, these substances that remove the biofilm, the serum peptase, the, the MSM. We're taking binders, you know, in in a treatment setting to ensure that we're taking out that meta, that metabolic waste and that, you know, ensuring that we don't have a Herx reaction, too much of a die off detoxification reaction, which can definitely happen. And if that's happening to you, back off, go yes. a little bit slower, right? That's like, or everyone goes, oh my gosh, do I always have to Winston Churchill it? Where it's like, if you're going through hell, keep going. That's probably not the most sustainable way to do it, unless, mm. you know, unless you maybe like, you know you're single, you, your full-time job is your health, you don't have kids, you know, like something like then absolutely go through it. You know, you, you've got time to go and do your water fasting and tune into it and all that kind of stuff. But otherwise, give yourself permission to back off and really think what are the pillars, especially dietarily, especially some of the, that eliminating of those, um, of those food groups and those grains and those sugars that are, you know, possibly the glutinous grains. You know, I think that's, we're all in agreement in that, in that healing period that that's not going to be useful. Um, and at the same time, then you start bringing in the powder arcos, the mushies, some of these supplements, liver supporting with the shizandra. You know, just make sure if you're really dying off hard, you know, maybe back off, you know, a little bit from those, um, 
you know, from those mushrooms, you know, just lower the dose just a little bit, but especially those like, you know, the serum peptase and those mm. substances that are going to be breaking down your biofilm. But at the same time, with a nice balanced approach, um, your, your body should have what it takes to remove that as you go along. So one of, what I was saying there is what I like about the medicinal mushrooms and many of the things we're talking about, especially distinction around diet, is it gets to a point where perhaps you get your symptoms under control and you're no longer feeling drunk from the candida off gassing. You're, you're not feeling, um, you know, those, those mood swings. You're not as immunologically susceptible to little, like, you know, the smallest little cold and, and so on and so forth. You go, wow, I'm actually getting some traction here. And you start to then move in towards embodying a lot of these principles that you've learned through your healing journey, but then go to more of a maintenance, you know, how do I design my lifestyle and my personal culture so that this isn't going to come up again once you've identified that there's a possible susceptibility there. So in this phase, Sage, what do you feel are the pillars? What would you be particularly tonifying to ensure that that doesn't happen again? Yeah, I think once you've had a history of, of real strong candida situation, um, you probably will not be able to have a future of having the same levels of carbohydrate consumption and sugar consumption and, and fruit consumption as somebody who hadn't. Um, it, it does seem to be, a, you're kind of at risk of this forever. Um, it, maybe Dan can provide some more insights in, in, into why and, and, and how you could maybe get around that. But it's you're, you're always going to be a little bit more vulnerable to it than the average person. And so I think you always want to keep these mushrooms as a part of your life for their adaptogenic properties, for their immune enhancing properties, for their anti-inflammatory properties, you know, so many benefits. And they're gonna be keeping the candida at bay. And so you wanna keep um, your, your carbohydrate consumption within a reasonable range, stay away from really starchy things. You know, if you're having like a gluten-free bread, don't be having one that's made of like corn flour and oat flour and potato flour that are just going to be skyrocketing your blood sugar. Mm, thanks for bringing that up. We have ours. I think it's out. We have rice, potato, um, tapioca um, mm, here. No. I think they're the big yeah. ones. We don't get much corn, but yeah, I think I, I'm, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I still think we're getting a new wave of people entering into the health scene and going gluten-free and not realizing the extent of um, what these gluten-free grains that we've just you know and um you know these flowers just the impact that they're having on your glycemic load and you know in feeding these things like you know bacterial overgrowth and fungal overgrowth yeah even william davis who who is a, he's a medical doctor he wrote one of the first big books um back in the in the 2000s that really blew up on um, bringing awareness to the needs to be for people to be gluten-free and it was around the time that it really yeah. took off wheat he, belly says, uh, wheat belly that's it right i, mm -hmm. I, was, I was misplacing the name wheat belly yes um he even says most gluten-free products are worse for you than the gluten products because of these high glycemic uh starchy compounds in them yes so be aware of that because those can be really sneaky you might think oh this is great it's gluten-free how wonderful and magical i can eat toast again um <laughs> Be careful, be careful. So there's like, there's one gluten-free bread made here in California. That's like, it uh, doesn't have any of those. It's primarily just quinoa and millet and that in moderation mm. I, do, I do really well with. Yeah. Um, Ours I, here I, is I think widely spring wellness, I think is the brand. Uh -huh. Yeah, here for those people in the US, it's Grindstone Bakery. Um, they mm. make a really nice one. And, and so, you know, kind of the long-term and that, that I found myself in dietary wise is um, cyclical ketosis combined with some intermittent fasting um, to, to stimulate the autophagy and the anti-aging benefits and, um, and, and the hormonal benefits that that brings along. And then you just want to keep, yeah, as I said, these mushrooms as a, as a part of your life and, you know, have some patriarchal every now and then you, when you feel called towards it and, and make sure you're food combining in a way that doesn't cause um, digestive disturbance and, and, and gas and bloating because if it is it's probably setting up a breeding ground for some of these bad bacteria and fungi to kind of take over again and you don't, you don't want to give them that, that entry and you got to figure out for you personally what is the level of, of fruit and carbohydrate consumption that you can handle and as as you progressively heal over the years that may, may, may grow a little bit as your metabolism kind of comes back to where it originally would have been um, mm -hmm. but yeah, be mindful of that because a lot of people say, okay, I dealt with candida. Now I can have as many, you know, dates and, and berries and, and pineapple and papaya and whatever, and just go wild. But it, you, you can't, you can't do that. It's, it's, you're going to end up back in a bad situation. Yeah. 40 bananas a day. eh? 
Oh my god! <laughs> Dead. Um, like, I remember right when I was in like early stage candida recovery. I, you know, I, I, I met a guy and he was trying to tell me, yeah, yeah, fruitarianism. You just have to eat more, more fruits. Your body adapts to knowing what to do with it. Mm. You gotta be kidding me! Come yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, I think we, we, you definitely see, you know, uh, we, if we get into the dietary conversation, maybe we'll have another podcast around dietary fads and appropriateness <laughs> because you're going to find with all of these diets, there's going to be a particular constitution or a particular energetic of an illness or an overgrowth that's going, you know, maybe that person, well, it's hard to believe in terms of a candida infection, but maybe one person might get a little bit of a um, of benefit just through the stripping that they're going to get through all that fruit. And we're talking about a phenomena, the fruitarian um, 80, 10, 10, 40 bananas a day that was like probably really hot 10 years ago. I think we've all, um, Thank you. Think, that, you know, it's kind of moved away. Yeah. And I, th I think the kind of the current rendition in terms of maybe not in terms of the fanaticism at the top of the dietary hierarchy, but definitely in terms of a lot of the followers, we see the medical medium probably being the closest, um, oh, yeah. to that mm -hmm. these days in terms of this, like, well, I don't know much about herbalism i don't know really anything about candida rather than what the leader of this diet that i follow is said about it but what i know is that if you follow this diet you'll heal it no matter what like what is it candida no no problem yeah no no problem whereas like what we're going to find you know in the kind of diet like that yeah it's got great things and great distinctions of course i'm not poo-pooing it but if if you if you with any of these treatments if you just get a really wide blanket over anything you're going to find especially in this instance where there's women with extreme deficiencies and extreme dampness and then immune, um, immune deficiency. If you start putting on a lot of cold, wet foods that, and a lot, you know, even like foods like, you know, if you look at TCM, you know, I, I'm a big fan of celery, but it's actually quite heating in terms of its, you know, in, in terms of its, it's like, in terms of its energetics, you're actually going to start, you know, getting in there and aggravating the damp heat of candida when it's done in excess. And so everyone needs to just kind of like take everything with a grain of salt, find your own path. And yeah, just thought I'd throw that in there. So Dan, at that stage, when you're transitioning, what are some of your key factors and what you like looking at and um, getting, what did you get onto? What did you, what do you get other people onto? I think once people have gotten over the initial hurdle and they're, they're back online, um, getting them to form a new relationship with it with their body is super super key and to identify where they're vulnerable and where the threats are coming in and I always say to folks stress paralyzes the immune response period it's that simple stress paralyzes your immune response and so um getting people to really identify where the stresses of their lives are coming in whether it's people whether it's the job whether it's environmental mm -hmm. Mm. that's financial you have to take appropriate lifestyle measures you can't just you know you can you can throw antifungal herbs at yourself to the cows come home but if you don't nail those things and those foundations and the and the dietary stuff like you guys are saying <clears throat> you're limiting the amount of um benefits that you're going to get long term you can get immediate benefits you can feel better for about a week mm. but you really want to fortify a new lifestyle where as i say you know immediately when you can recognize where the, where you're leaking jing and where the, where the stress is starting to impact your immune system and you go, aha, okay, I can feel that white blood cell drop, you know, mm -hmm. um, getting folks to recognize that. Whereas maybe, you know, in times gone on part times gone by, they might, you know, um, just sort of mow over that with, with caffeine or sugar, you know, and, and they might've felt it, but not known what to do with it. And it's like, no, now it, when you feel that again, that means you need to pull back on this and you probably need to hit this, this and this and, and to bring yourself back into balance. So it sounds super simple, but yeah, just, just identifying where those, where those stresses are coming in mm. and knowing that it's going to have a very um, immunological you know, um, weakening. Yeah, and I definitely think it's worth acknowledging lifestyle-wise that you're undergoing a transition. I know um, it can it can be quite isolating if you do have a very gnarly candida infection, and it's like you know, depending on where you came from, it's like it might be all of a sudden you're taken out from being able to go eat out um, from the usage of alcohol, you know, with the grains within alcohol that very much feeding candida, so on and so forth. And so really ensuring that you're psychologically set up and that you're finding ways to go out and enjoy life and celebrate life and be with your friends that aren't revolving around aggravators. And then once you've, you know, but really ensuring that you don't isolate yourself and, you know, ensuring that you, you know, don't get judgy of what other people are doing. My God, just do not by any means, you know, like let, 
it happen via, via osmosis. If you, you know, if you care about someone, let the results speak for themselves. But um, I definitely wouldn't preach any of this to anyone once you suddenly become enlightened to how sugar feeds candida. And at the same time, when you're transitioning back into your life and you're starting possibly really going, right, socializing a little bit more, you know, as Sage was saying, over a few years, you might feel you become a little bit more robust in a metabolic level when it comes to fruit. And you can maybe, you know, take as much as you would have normally been able to pre-candida. You know, with you're going to be able to do that, you know, to an extent with other you know, other areas of life that we associate with going out and really you know, like celebrating and enjoying ourselves and eating out. But, you know, just keep a check on yourself. You know, don't, I just, I would make sure you don't lose yourself in that energy. So you go and undo all your good work. Um, but at the same time, really acknowledge, you know, finding ways that you can keep that up and keep on doing that in a way that isn't lame. You know, I know it can be lame for someone saying like, oh, just take kombucha to a party. It's like, oh, shut up. <laughs> just you know like and so just <laughs> um i think that's a huge part of it um ongoingly as well um i you know i'll definitely just throw you know um throw my support um behind looking up you know when you when you've like you know for lack of a better word healed you know ensuring that you don't slip into excessive tendencies you know when it comes to the consumption of grain gluten um, you know, you might feel that it's better to leave these out of your diet. If you're just like, no, I kind of like, I'm going to include them. Really look at appropriate usage, you know, with alcohol as well. Bring a lot of intention to the way you do it and just keep on reading the way your body relates and reacts to these mm -hmm. substances so that you can create a very beautiful integrated culture for you and your lifestyle that is allowing you to kind of like in a way, have your cake and eat it too, but just, you know, be slow and methodical with that process and don't ignore the fact just because it's inconvenient that you have a tendency towards candida infection because yeah. that yeah. will bite, that will bite your 80 year old, 90 year old self on the ass. But um, at the same time, don't throw out this celebratory party animal at the same time, because then you'll be, you know, you'll be absolutely taking the, the jive out of your 80, 90 year old self. Mm, um, yeah. I definitely like the, the inclusion, as Sage said, like appropriately, you know, bring in powder arco here, there, when you feel like it. Um, I like including medicinal mushrooms on rotation in the diet. Um, when I get to that point, um, if you've had a tendency towards, um, especially if you have a tendency towards flemminess and dampness within the body, um, I like chi tonics and spleen tonics to keep up that digestive um, potency from a tonic herb perspective. So herbs like astragalus, um, or is it astragalus, Sage? Um, astragalus here, but I don't know how you guys do it there. I'm still learning. We, we switch. We, 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 we switch. go back and forth. Man, we're having a, I'm having a bloody identity. You? Yeah, it's an identity crisis when it comes to pronouncing um, astragalus, astragalus. But um, beautiful herb for continuing to tone the spleen chi to just ensure that we are maintaining proper digestive health and governing of digestive health, along with wider trachylodes, uh, cotinopsis, um, you know, even a little bit of licorice is going to be doing some good stuff in there. Ginseng. These are all wonderful chi herbs that I, um, I see as wonderful components to, you know, just in upkeeping our general health. Shizandra to an extent falls in that category, but I'd still, um, I'd still be looking at like astragalus, um, cotinopsis, wider trachylodes, just here and there. Keep it up. Make and sure you incorporate poria in there as well, Mason. Oh man. Yeah. Poria, I can't believe has, I can't believe we didn't bring up and I can't believe I haven't got it as a herb on its own. Talk about a mushroom that's got a branding problem. Somehow in Taoist and, and even through TCM theory and, and herbalism, every single longevity formula has poria in it. Mm -hmm. Not reishi, like nearly every longevity formula has got this, this, incredible immunological mushroom poria have you seen the pictures of me harvesting that thing it was 20 kilos Super crazy. incredible dude this like i'll get a get a picture down in the in the notes everyone but this this mushroom growing on wild pine is this huge mound that grows under the soil yeah it's 20 kilos and then when you dry it it becomes kind of like a gyp rock um you know you know like those you know the the um what is it you know you pick up those white um the white gyp rocky kind of thing at the at the beach and you give it to the birds to nuzzle, to, to nibble on and cuttlefish. Like, you know, cuttlefish yeah it's kind of like that kind of texture as well when it's dried but as a herb in terms of its um it's the probably the primary chi spleen toning medicinal mushroom that's when you're dealing with candida of course a wet damp hot environment is where a yeast infection is going to grow. So you have a high amount of inflammation. That's why all the while we're talking about things like 
serum peptase, medicinal mushrooms that are taking down these chronic levels of inflammation, right? But then at the same time, pori is going in and moving chi, like in instances of edema, you see it being very effective. You see it being very effective at moving the puddle of water chi sitting beneath the heart and dampening the fire of the heart and moving that on and then helping to tone the kidneys abilities to transform water chi and remember how to move that through the body. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's like, that's why I slipped it into the Mason's mushrooms because I just wanted everyone to be on it. You know, like you I said that as an individual herb as well. No, I can't, I can't believe I don't, but that's why I'm in. It's got like, it's got a branding problem. So I'll, I will, I'm working on that. Um, you know what it's like, you know, it's like, you think it's just as easy. It's just a matter of like adding a product to the, to the range. And it's just like this huge process and this huge educating process. And I, there also needs to be a subtle activation of something when I know it's time and it's definitely getting there to be time. Um, yeah. it's, it's definitely a huge push, I feel, in terms of educating around chi tonics that's coming from our perspective within Superfeast um, and definitely with Poria. But I'm always just stoked when people are having Mason's mushrooms and I've got Poria in there doing that thing. I actually think it's one of the more wonderful mushrooms that you know for treating um, and helping with candida and mm. basically supporting that spleen function. So thank you very much for bringing that up. I'm really Can I just add in there, guys, as well? I think for yeah. the listeners, um, what Mason's talking about with spleen chi, um, a lot of people obviously will already know, but I think a, a good way to explain spleen chi, I find, is when, when you feel that that has really been augmented, it's like your body almost fights gravity better. Your, your stature, your muscles, everything sits up you know, so much, so much stronger and so much better. Mm. And if you, think it, if you have a pathogenic load, everything wants to droop. Mm. And, and you know go with gravity and fall but when your spleen chi is really rocking it's like the opposite happens you, you, your muscles sit up better your your posture is better your outlook is better you feel like you're fighting gravity better that's that's um you know a, a really important distinction i think to i remember feeling that for the first time years ago with um high amounts of astragalus when it was appropriate mm. you know, and and reigniting that and going oh wow that's what that feels like again mm, feeling upright chi Again, I mean, cheese, like, you know, it's, it's definitely governing that up, down, in, out, um, controlling the heat, controlling the movement of liquids within the body. It's, um, it's a wonderful thing and a definite, definite one in terms of maintenance. I'm definitely leaning more and more towards chi tonics myself with them. Yeah. Um, and it's also nice to see that the chi does, you see a crossover um, a lot of the time with chi tonics um, being medicinal mushrooms and doing their own, you know, doing their own thing from an immunological level to upkeep that vitality. And, um, and at the same time, all these things you were talking about, like ensuring that we're not becoming sodden and weighed down by all this infection and all this calcification, um, absolutely integral. Great to have the Jing there. So we don't get to the exhausted state where we can't actually have, you know, we, we are not actually able to use the chi from our breath and our food, the Gucci, and as well from our water. Um, and then, you know, being able to actually then rock it with our lifestyle. Um, the other thing I just make sure I want to tell everyone is um, watch your poo, look at your poo. Mm. Um, because it, it can it can be quite easy to get into a justification of a diet and not acknowledge the fact that you know you might be constipated then we're definitely going to have to look at that and, it, and this is going back to at the beginning of the treatment but especially the aftermath when you're really ensuring that you're staying in a nice healthy place you want nice healthy solid um nice coloration maybe a you know a brownish hue in the poo um and as well just you know just uh, because when you get into like that all right i'm in a nourishing spleen diet warming foods you know like you know soupy kind of foods you want to find that balance between that and maybe then you your you know veggies the appropriate amount of easily digestible um you know raw greens or you know like a small amount of raw food to kind of have you know that's appropriate for you because sometimes people can lean too much in that tcm spleen cook everything to oblivion which i do i like for you know like for meat stews and that kind of thing i like slow cooking meats i think the spleen absolutely drinks it up and it's really easy to make blood from it but you can watch your poo and if it starts to go sloppy, it's time to bring a little bit more roughage and, and, and rethink the way that you're approaching it. Um, and also the reason I'm liking these binders and cleaning up the diet, because quite often everyone's like, people are going like, yeah, no, I poo. You know, I, 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 I poo regularly, but what we don't realize is that there are these stuck pockets up through the colon. Um, and so just being able to, you know, I don't know how you guys go about like identifying, you know, you know, like, you know, colonoscopy is kind of like one of these things that just identifies it like that. Um, but I don't love shoving things in the body if we don't have to. So I definitely 
like just bringing in the distinction of not basically just not bringing processed foods into the diet that are going to accumulate in these little pockets within the body. Um, I love binders for this reason. I love clays going and doing this. I love, you know, what Dan was talking about in the morning. If you're going with your clay, maybe add that little bit of chia in there. You know, other fire, you know, like what was the other fiber you were talking about? You didn't say slippery elm. Oh, you did slippery elm as well. These basic beautiful soothers, this is going to be a great long term um, aid to you in ensuring. And then just keep on watching your poo. Is it going sloppy? You know, is it going hard? Are you constipated? All right, let's look at our diet and our lifestyle and make some tweaks. So stay slippery and adaptable with that as well. Mm. And then just continue to embody these principles of your culture and your lifestyle that you're going to be really proud to pass on to your community, to your children, because that's like, you know, that's ultimately where it's at. Um, Sage, do you have any last thoughts on everything? No, that was really wonderful. And it's a pleasure speaking with both of you guys. Thank you for having me on with you. Yeah, thanks so much, bro. Dan, have you got any wrap-up thoughts? One, um, one, just one quick thing I, I failed to mention at the start when we're talking about testing. Um, one that I, I do run and I'm quite a big fan of is the organic acids test, which is relatively new, or the OAT test, O-A-T. Um, that actually has a section where you can test fungal metabolites in the urine. So it's a urine sample that you send to a lab and you get a wealth of information about all different types of areas of the body. So neurotransmitters, B vitamin absorption and whatnot, but one specific area is fungal metabolites. Um, and sometimes the gut test can, can miss them or sometimes the candida just isn't in the gut. It's in the respiratory system or it's in, you know, or it's topical, you know, um, jock itch or cradle cap, you know, it's, it's, um, it's on the, it's on the skin. So, um, that test is really, really good. Sometimes, um, if you've got the opportunity to do that at the start of seeing someone and to get a baseline of those metabolites and then follow that up, you know, months on or, or whatever, um, to, to check if that's now in check. Um, cause I've seen what happens in the past is that candida gets, gets blamed for something and there is candida there, but it, it is actually more of a bacterial issue, more of a dysbiosis condition. Um, so you can knock the, the candida back, but the, the person's still symptomatic. Then it's like, mm. aha. The candida might, might have been playing a, a bit bit of the role there, but it's more likely, you know, bacterial overgrowth in the small or large intestine or something else. So um, organic acids test, huge fan of it. And that's one I often um, run in the clinic here. Oh, wonderful. So it's like the tagline, of, the tagline is now, um, check your we, we'll see if we can heal you functionally. Dan Simple, functional naturopath. <laughs> you, can, you, can use it. you can use that, that's free. And... Um, uh, thank you so much, boys, for coming on and sharing your knowledge and giving your time. Um, I know everyone listening to this is really appreciating such a comprehensive um, and multidimensional look at Candida and how to go about really um, getting their body into a state where it's no longer prevalent. So um, have a beautiful, beautiful day, guys. And I can't wait to jump back on with you next time. <laughs>